It was such a long journey, and we are finally ready to face Tiamat the Dragon Queen in the conclusive battle of the Tyranny of Dragons campaign. We grew stronger, made alliances and gathered armies that are now marching towards the Well of Dragons to stop the ritual and save Toril from an apocalypse. Let's discuss the final chapter of The Rise of Tiamat and prepare for running it as smoothly as we can. You're watching Lutz and Dice, and I'm your bard, Folkard. <laughs> So let's dissect this game session into parts. What do we want to have in this chapter? We want to set up the scene and have some role-playing moments that would wrap up some character stories, relationships and probably have some retrospect on the past journey before going for a final thrust. Let's call it the column before the storm. We also want some sort of awesome display of armies clashing together, at least as a narrative, but ideally the party to have a fight in the middle of just mayhem with giants, dragons and spells flying around. Finally and obviously the ritual and the fight with Tiamat. Oh, and of course, an epilogue. So first of all, I would pack the entire gathering and marching of the armies into one paragraph of narrative. I encourage you to give it a few minutes and prepare an actual text, and I would apply this to a lot of things in the final chapter. Some of the highlights of the great battle, the appearance of the temple, the ritual Tiamat, her demise or perhaps victory. You want all of it to sound epic, poetic and to really stand out. Let the players feel that this is a truly special moment on an emotional level. And so we come to our first point the calm before the storm. This depends entirely on your tastes and the general mood of your campaign. I chose to set this part in the war camp, the night before the great battle begins, and give my players some time to talk to their NPC friends. It might be Leo scene, Lairal Silverhand, some custom NPCs of your own creation. You can have these moments set in Waterdeep or any other place. But there can be a lot of nice reasons to have a moment like this. For me it was to provide yet another reminder of what is this all about. What do we fight for? Love, freedom, friendship. I remember one of the PCs discovering that her boyfriend was in the war camp. She came to see him and found him getting equipped by a squire for the fight. He was a merchant from Baldur's Gate and she said, what are you doing? You're not a fighter. But he would never forgive himself if something was to happen to her and he wasn't there, given everything that he has to offer. Things like these provided memorable role-playing moments and helped to set the stage before the final mission of the game. This is also the time to make final preparations like spells and equipment, and also to devise a plan. Perhaps the players have some ideas on how they want to infiltrate the temple, use the battle assets on the battlefield to bring some kind of a plan to life and fly to the temple on the back of a dragon, which normally wouldn't be possible, but you should allow yourself to think outside of the box here. Just be attentive to your group, maybe they'll come up with something really clever, and picture this finale, try to make it your own and not follow what the book suggests precisely, because I'll be honest, it's not good. It doesn't really suggest a specific course of events, but the dungeon, the dungeon inside of the volcano implies that that is the way into the temple with a bunch of skirmishes with the cultists, and my best advice about this dungeon is to ditch it. Just get rid of it, it's bad, it doesn't have any meaning. You can leave it as a passage, as an optional way to get inside, and have one fight in there, but not just with the cultists or with that weird guy in Ergoth Bladelord, who is just written into existence out of nowhere. I would rather place a familiar face in there, a villain who escaped earlier in the story, but I'll get back to that in a moment. The clashing of armies. This is something that I would think through and conjure some cinematic descriptions for beforehand as well. I really don't recommend trying to take a board game approach and try to use any sorts of rules for handling armies, unless you really know what you're doing, like you've playtested it. I think that D&D is just not about that. You focus on player characters and everything else is just background. Here is how you can reflect the hard work that's been done to bring all the assistant armies together. Just have a thorough look back at all those chapters in The Rise of Tiamat, at how much effort the party has put into winning over the giants, the arcane brotherhood, the metallic dragons, and weave the payout into the narrative. It can be a huge variety of tiny situations. There's an NPC across the battlefield who is dear to a player's heart and they are about to get smashed by an enemy. But then the enemy's head explodes as a powerful spell hits it, and the players see Macath the Grimson standing a few yards away with a smoke in hand. You get the idea, I'm sure you'll come up with your own cool moments like that. You can help the pieces as well, heal them, bless them with some dwarven clerics from behind. Now about the villain I was talking about earlier. 
This is also a great time to throw in a mini-boss, and the chapter provides us with this undead guy, the Blade Lord. But if you follow my suggestion, let's better use something from the past. And my favorite option is, if Razmir died earlier on, bring her back here as an Abishai. Abishais were featured in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, and here is some information from the book. Each Abishai was once a mortal who somehow won Tiamat's favor before death, and as a reward, found its soul transformed into a hideous devil to serve at her pleasure in the Nine Hells. Expert assassins and infiltrators, black Abishais can weave shadows to mask their presence, allowing them to reach a location from when they can deliver a fatal strike to their targets. The Ritual If you want Tiamat to appear, and especially if you know that your players do, then why even try to disrupt the ritual as a gameplay? I'm not suggesting that you trash the scene with the Red Wizards and Severin, but understanding your true goals is an important thing, your desired outcome of the encounter for the sake of the narrative. Maybe Tiamat will come in 10 rounds no matter what, but disrupting the summoning is just another way to weaken her. I mean, as characters, of course they don't want Tiamat to get even close to their world, but as players, having taken part in such a long and daunting journey of 15 levels, I don't see how anybody would not feel like this is anticlimactic to not be given a chance to fight a goddess. But anyway, let's talk about the ritual itself. First of all, this is perhaps the first time the players get to meet Severin, sort of, because they don't have a chance to really talk to him. He's levitating in the air, busy with the ritual. Well, talking about bland villains, this guy is the king. Nothing much in the entire campaign really touches his personality. No particular option for us to flash him out somehow. He's pretty much a powerful madman, a cliché mad wizard that needs to be killed. And this scene is one tiny window that allows us to show the players the guy who is responsible for all this mess. And even though I say that he's a cliché and not really interesting, it's important not to underrate his role in the story. Because really, he is the reason Tiamat is rising, you have to give him that. This is the man that thousands of cultists and hundreds of dragons followed to this moment. As a DM, you have to pay tribute to that. So imagine yourself in his place. He is the most devoted fanatic who witnesses a miracle in his perception. His beloved goddess is about to arrive and reward him for setting her free from her prison in the Nine Hells. His eyes burn with awe and loathing for the player characters. But perhaps he is so into the moment that the party's efforts seem ridiculous and funny to him. They might have caused quite some troubles on the way, but there's absolutely no way they're going to stand a chance against his goddess. What I like to do in every boss fight is something that I've stolen from video games. I don't like borrowing too much from those, because it rarely translates well to tabletop. But I found that this little touch works pretty satisfyingly for me. I give my villains catchphrases for the fights. Kind of like bosses in World of Warcraft, when they use a staple ability, they would accompany it with an edgy commentary that unfolds their personalities, gives some flavor to the situation, and serves as an exposition sometimes. And more often than not, those phrases contain some allegory that would connect the flavor of the ability to the story, or something like that. That depends on your tastes, but in this example it might be as simple as let the flames of the Dragon Queen consume you, followed by a scorching burst. Or when Severin uses his Hellish Chains legendary action, he might say something along the lines of have a taste of Tiamat's pain implying that she was imprisoned by hellish chains in hell. So, Severin also has an evil pseudo-dragon companion. When I ran the game, I totally forgot about it. It's supposed to try and avenge Severin's death, but at this point a pseudo-dragon would die to an angry glance from a player character. But keep it in mind, perhaps there will be a suiting moment where you can do something cool. Before the players are going to face Tiamat, they need to spend 10 rounds trying to disrupt the ritual. Ten Red Wizards, including Wrath Modar, have to maintain the ritual during these ten rounds. If fewer than five wizards spend their action to perform the ritual for two rounds in succession, the count of successful rounds resets to zero. The difficulty is that the spires, or chapels, where the Red Wizards are located are really far away from each other, about 200 feet away. The temple is huge, I'm not sure this is necessary, and I would consider making the temple smaller. You would think that it's because Tiamat has to fit inside, but have a look at this. Tiamat is of gargantuan size, and yeah, it's 20 by 20 feet. This is what it looks like, she is tiny compared to the environment. Speaking of the layout of the temple, you might have noticed that it's pretty bland, and I've seen some alterations made by different DMs where instead of a flat surface and five spires, they would make five huge pillars upon which the Red Wizards stand. 
perhaps they grow straight from a pool of lava and, and the pillars can be connected with bridges. But that's definitely something to consider, just be sure you don't make the encounter far more dangerous than it already is. So yeah, red wizards, they use mage statistics, and you should really get familiar with the spell lists, because during the fight you can easily screw things up, for example, by having a flying wizard cast greater invisibility, just as I did in my game. Both spells require concentration, so you know, learning that beforehand would be really helpful, and also help you design their tactics, rather than just throwing random spells at the party. Remember that their number one goal is to keep the ritual running. I would imagine the wizards would make full use of spells like counter spell, shield, and greater invisibility to avoid getting interrupted. Wrath Motor has even more spells at his disposal that can really slow down the party, like Mislead and Confusion. And as I've said before, I would make it so that the ritual would only weaken Tiamat even more, rather than preventing her from appearing completely. But I wouldn't go too far with weakening either, perhaps stay within the suggested 5 levels of penalties. You see, it really depends on your party's size and their magic items and how good your players are with tactics. For example, if after the entire Tyranny of Dragons campaign they still haven't figured out that standing close to each other is a bad idea when facing a dragon, they're going to die in this battle, I guarantee that. One piece of advice I can give is to look at your player's sheets and Tiamat's stat block to get an idea of your player's weak spots and strong sides. If they don't have the luxury of spells like Prayer of Healing, Protection from Energies, Protection from Evil and Good, since Tiamat is a fiend, not a dragon. Perhaps let them have a couple of clerics with them. Another way you can make the fight more bearable is to have chunks of the collapsed temple ceiling provide potential covers from Tiamat's breath. If sometime before the fight a player would ask somebody for some knowledge and advice regarding Tiamat, which they really should, good! Let every possible sage who's somehow around try to help them, and possibly reveal some aspects of her stat block, but in no way you should hold your punches when running the Dragon Queen. She has to be supernaturally clever and cunning and extremely deadly. She has an intelligence of 26 after all. First of all, when she appears, make it the most epic scene of the entire game. This doesn't necessarily need to be a swirling portal, perhaps the portal has a form of a pit, like the one we've seen in the official trailer, and the pit magically connects the Well of Dragons and Tiamat's prison in Avernus. The way she appears, gradually head by head, is not my favorite thing too. You can have her appear in all her glory at once for a cool epic effect, but still make her have only bite attacks, and add one breath attack each round as she is sort of disoriented from the interplanar journey. Having a smaller temple here would also allow for a nice moment of collapsing the ceiling, or making it explode outward so that it doesn't kill the players. But the point is to make the battlefield visible and the dragons swirling above. I think it would add greatly to the epicness of the scene. If you feel that you need to have a safe for your players up your sleeve, in case something goes really wrong for them, make sure that your deus ex machina is satisfying. For example, if you've included my side adventure into the game, you can find it on Patreon, the party had a chance to befriend a metallic dragon, saving his life. So if the group is about to die from Tiamat's breath, Fyro, the metallic dragon, might suddenly fly in and cover them with his body, sacrificing himself and thus returning the favor. This is a nice blood device, because the party had earned it in a way. I hope it gives you ideas for something equivalent. Well, I could probably talk for hours and still not cover every little aspect. I think I've shared enough and the rest is up to you, so good luck, I'm sure you'll handle it great. One final piece of advice is to think of a nice, satisfying epilogue. When Tiamat is banished, you can't just end the game there. Make sure you give your players some glorious details of what happens next. That is something to prepare and write down beforehand as well. Try to capture their impact on the world. Perhaps songs of their heroic adventures are being sung across the Sword Coast. Describe a painting hanging on a wall of a small tavern where they stopped near the very beginning of their journey. It will have an especially powerful effect if any of the PCs have perished along the way or in the final battle. You might also fast forward a month ahead and make them meet in a place that meant something to them, and let them have a conclusive word in this story. And that's it. It's been such a long time since I've started this series, I'm almost getting emotional for some reason. Thank you all very much for being with me and watching my videos. Your comments about how this series helped you improve the game means so much to me. I'm really proud of you. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll meet in our future adventures.